Good evening again. Welcome to our Wednesday night Bible study as we continue our study through the book of Ezekiel. And I just wanted to give you a long introduction before we get into uh, our lesson this evening, uh, which is from chapter 12. And uh, one of the topics that God deals with is the fact that man looks at the prophetic word and man looks at the prophecies that God has given to him and man says, what's taking so long? Right? Some of us right now, we're, we're looking around, we're looking at the news, we're looking at the events unfolding around us, and we're hoping for the Lord to return, saying, Lord, what's taking you so long? How much more of this are we going to be able to take? But we do know, based on current events, and I'm a student of the Word of God, and there's uh, two schools of thought. Some people say, oh, we can never know when the Lord is going to come back. How many of you have heard those people? We don't know, we don't know, we don't know. But the Bible is clear that we do know because Jesus himself tells us regarding a second coming that when you see these things occur, I'm coming. So if, he, if we see the signs of his second coming in our lifetime, that means the rapture is not too far away. We can know. There are some denominations though that teach no, well, like we said, that teach no one can come, that no one can know, and others yet tell us that these things are not going to happen. I mean, in the book of Revelation, we've dealt with many, the four different interpretations of prophecy. Uh, there are some people who believe that uh, the book of Revelation is simply <coughs> allegorical, symbolic, a bunch of images and symbols, and we can never really know what it's talking about. That is not truth. Just go through the study of uh, the book of Revelation, and you'll see we ma made great effort to unpack the book for you, and it would be a blessing to your soul if you go back and listen to those lessons. And the Apostle Peter tells us that when the last days come about, people will question the last days, whether we are in the last days. Uh, in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 3 and 4, he says, Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts. Welcome to America. Now, most Americans, I hate to say, even Christians included, walk after their own lusts. That means what they want to do becomes priority. Not what God wants them to do. That's what, that's what it means, walking after your own lusts. And saying, and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. We're going to see this uh, mindset in the passage that we'll be studying this evening in the book of Ezekiel. I remember when I was a teenager, everyone said, oh, 2000, the year 2000 is coming. Y2K, catastrophe, the Lord is returning. How many of you have heard of that? Yeah. So they said, 1993, the tribulation starts. Uh, I remember that when I was, I was a teenager. And did it happen? It did not happen. Mm -hmm. So as I got older in the Lord, I realized that the problem was they were not counting from the right day. As simple as that. Uh, the Bible teaches that God has given the earth 6,000 years, and the seventh millennia, of the earth's history is called the what in the book of Hebrews? Well, it's called the millennial kingdom in the book of Revelation, but in the book of Hebrews, what is this called? What is this seventh millennia or millennium? I don't know which word I should use, millennia or millennium. Maybe somebody could, uh, uh, yes, somebody got it. Uh, there's someone logged in as Santa Claus and he's called it the rest. Yes, you got it right. Well, whoever you are, Santa Claus, uh, you got the answer right. If somebody logged in and see he said it's Santa Claus. And the kid, I guess the kids know who he is, but he, he's not Santa Claus. I'm just telling you, Santa Claus is not logged in to, uh, to the lesson. He's not plugged in? Okay. But anyway, Santa Claus got it right. The book of Hebrews calls the seventh millennia. Now I need to be corrected because I don't know if it's seventh millennia or seventh millennium. It was uh, when I was in... Uh, Kid in elementary school, I slept through English class. So the seventh millennium is called the rest in the book of Hebrews. It's called the rest. So the Bible is clear that there's going to be a seventh, the last thousand years of earth's history is going to be a rest where God is going to rule and reign. And that's very clear in the book of Revelation. So is that the Amazon package again? Or he's coming to the Bible study? Invite the Amazon guy to the Bible study. Okay, it's the Amazon people. Uh, unbelievable. They come at all hours of the day. They come Sunday night. They come on Christmas. Yes, they're working. Come to the Bible study. Join us. Yeah, the garbage man is starting 
they do the same thing. Yes, right? Garbage man. Caesar says the garbage man is starting to do the same thing. So, why am I telling you all this? Because in tonight's lesson, you, we're going to see an attitude that was prevalent among the Jews in Ezekiel's day and in Jeremiah's days, that the prophecies that God had pronounced through his prophets weren't coming. So they're saying, it's not going to happen. How many of you talk to people today, and when you tell them the, the world's going to end soon, what do they say? It's not going to happen. You guys believe fairy tales. Right? They accuse us of believing fairy tales. Yes. You Bible thumpers, you, you, you guys believe, you guys, uh, what's the word called? You're so gullible. You believe in these things. That's yes. Except if it's a asteroid coming. And that's right. Going to solve okay, it. that's that's a funny thing. Uh, Sherry Menton mentioned about asteroid. It makes the news. But read the article. That asteroid is hundreds of thousands of miles away. It was farther away than Mars was. <laughs> That's right. It's farther away than Mars is from the Earth and they're sounding the alarms. It's crazy. So if... I believe, I believe we should be counting... Uh, the calendar should be set from Christ's ascension. That's what I believe. And if you start counting from Christ's ascension... Right now, it would be 1989. If you start counting from the ascension of Christ, it would be 1989. It would make sense because the, the New Age, not New Age, I better be careful, Freudian slip here, the Church Age began with the day of Pentecost, which happened a few days before the ascension of Christ. So that's when we should be counting. And if we do that, it would be 1989. So we're not far from the end. I believe that God has revealed a timeline to us I am of the opinion, and I do not apologize for this, I am of the opinion that God does everything in order. When did Christ come? 4,000 years after Adam. Do you think it's a coincidence that Christ came 4,000 years after God created Adam? No. How do we know that? Because God gives us all the dates in the Bible. We know all the dates. From Daniel, he says this is 400, uh, 449, 69 weeks after the decree to rebuild Jerusalem and the, and the walls and the streets, the Messiah will be cut off. So if God told us the timing of the first coming, do you think he wouldn't have told us the timing of the second coming? Approximately. Book of Hosea, chapter 5, at the end of chapter 5. Do some homework. Now read the last verse of Hosea and the first two verses of Hosea. The last verse of Hosea, chapter 5, and the first two verses of Hosea chapter 6, God tells us that he's going to come back after two days. And in the third day, we will be there. Okay, let's, uh, I see a lot of people wondering. Can someone go to Hosea chapter 5? And I want, you to I want you to see it. The last verse of Hosea chapter 5. Somebody read that for me. You do it. Percent. Hosea yeah. chapter 5. Verse 15. Yeah. Can you read it out loud so everybody sure. can hear it? Sure. Hosea 5 and verse 15. I will go and return to my place till they acknowledge their offense and seek my face in their affliction. They will seek me early. And then Hosea chapter 6, the first two verses. Uh, Come and let us return unto the Lord, for he hath torn, and he will heal us. He hath smitten, and he will bind us up. After two days will he revive us. In the third day, he will raise us up, and we shall live in his sight. Who's that talking about? The people of Israel, God's people. Very clearly, he has smitten, he has afflicted us, and after two days, he's going to come back, and in the third day, we will live in his sight. So two days from what? Two days from the first coming is the second coming, and the third day, and we've taught about this in the book of Revelation, God has given earth seven days. Yes. So for two days, two thousand years. Two days is two thousand years. And who tells us this? Who tells us that two days is a, a day is a thousand years? Exactly. Peter tells us that a day is a thousand years for the Lord and a thousand years is a day. So you put all these pieces. God gives us pieces of the puzzle. You know, I like doing puzzles. Of, uh, I don't get much joy out of them because they're too easy for me, even the big 5,000 piece puzzles. I, see, I have the ability to see how things go together. Uh, what I'm saying is that that's how God does it in the Word of God. He gives us pieces here and there. And our job is to know, to find all the pieces and put everything together. So don't be shocked when God tells us when He's going to come back. 
He tells us when he came the first time. He tells us when he, cause he's going to come back the second time. So don't be surprised. Acts 1.11, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus which is taken up from you into heaven, don't miss this, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. Yeah, that's a clue. You see him, he came up in the clouds. When he's going to come down, he's going to come down in the clouds again. Every eye shall see him. So why are, we, why are these people going around saying nobody knows, nobody knows? The only thing that we do not know is the day and the hour. That's the only thing we do not know. And in fact, Paul tells the Thessalonians, I have taught you about the end things. These things shouldn't surprise you. You know when the end shall come. So in this passage that we're going to look at momentarily, the Jews had developed an attitude that God's judgment would never come. They became complacent. The prophets of old had been prophesying that God would destroy Jerusalem. We've been hearing this for generations. Our grandparents heard this. Our great-grandparents heard this. I heard this from my grandmother and my mother. Nothing has happened. And God says in this passage, well, time's up. So with this introduction, lengthy introduction, let's begin in chapter 12, verse 21. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, what is that proverb that you have in the land of Israel saying? They, have, they, have, they had even developed a meme. The days are prolonged, every vision faileth. Tell them therefore, thus saith the Lord God, I will make this proverb to cease. They shall no more use it as a proverb in Israel, but say unto them, the days are at hand, and the effect of every vision. For there shall be no more any vain vision or flattering divination within the house of Israel. For I am the Lord, I will speak, and the word that I shall speak shall come to pass. It shall be no more prolonged. For in your days, O rebellious house, will I say the word, and will perform it, saith the Lord God. See that? In your days. You are saying that it's never going to come. Well, guess what? I've got a surprise for you, God says. It's going to happen in your days. Again, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, behold, the day of the house of Israel say, the vision that he seeth is for many days to come. And he, and he prophesieth of the times that are far off. Therefore say unto them, Thus saith the Lord, there shall none of my words be prolonged any more, but the word which I have spoken shall be done, saith the Lord God. So here in this passage, God through Ezekiel tells us that the Jews had developed a proverb, what we may call today a meme, I don't know if I'm using that word correctly, the days are prolonged and every vision faileth. This proverb, if you look at it in its, in its essence, was a mockery of the Lord's prophets. The Jews were making fun of God's prophets, you guys have been saying that God's going to be coming for such a long time. And I've heard a lot of people will tell us this too. You guys have been prophesying about destruction and doom and gloom. Where is it? Nothing's going to happen. Things continue as they always were. And even among the captives, those around Ezekiel believe this. Jeremiah 29, verses 27 and 28. Now therefore, why hast thou not reproved Jeremiah of Anatoth? which maketh himself a prophet to you. Now, who is this Jeremiah of Anatoth? Or Anatoth? Who is he? That's Jeremiah. That's Jeremiah the prophet. Jeremiah 1.1, 1, 1, he is introduced as Jeremiah of Anatoth. And these people are telling him, why don't you reprove him? Tell him to quit preaching all this negative stuff. Tell him to quit telling us how bad it's going to be. For therefore, he sent unto us in Babylon, saying... This captivity is long. Now notice this. Therefore, he, who is this he? Who are we talking about? Jeremiah. He sent unto us in Babylon, saying, This captivity is long. Build ye houses, and dwell in them, and plant gardens, and eat the fruit of them. Jeremiah sent them a letter. Jeremiah sent the people who were in captivity a letter saying, This captivity is going to be long. God told me it's going to be 70 years, you're not leaving, you're not going anywhere. So get comfortable, get yourself a job, get yourself an education if you have to, build some gardens in the backyard, send your kids to school, because you're gonna be here for a long time. Start businesses, buy homes. But the Jews believed that this was not gonna be the case. The things would continue as before. And all these prophecies of doom and gloom that they've been hearing all these generations would never come to pass. Even, even from the law even from the 
Mosaic law, God told the people, if you do this, the land's going to spit you up and you're going to go into captivity. And it finally happened. God promised that what he said would come to pass and it will no longer be prolonged. George Campbell Morgan, a British evangelist preacher said, the heart of man set upon evil courses constantly adopts one of these two expedients to comfort himself. Either it mocks at the prophetic word or says that fulfillment is postponed. And this is prevalent in many Christians today through their actions. Uh, and I'm going to say this and don't get offended. You probably will. You mock the word of God when you know what you're supposed to do and you don't do it. You basically are mocking God. When you ignore what God tells you to do, and I'm not trying to be offensive here, I'm trying to help you here. Uh, one of the things that I, I believe is, and I've always believed it as a, as a young man, feel bad and change. There's nothing wrong with that. I tell my kids, well, this life, tough. This is the DNA God has given you, you make the best of it. That's what I tell my children. So we deal with each child with his weaknesses. We say, okay, this is your issues, this is the issues that you're going to have in life. Because you are this way, yes, these are your strengths, but you're going to have to overcome your weaknesses to be successful. And when you put off what you know God wants you to do, you're basically saying, well, God doesn't really care if I do this or not. I'll get around to it eventually. We, we, we all are, we all, hey, we're all guilty of this. I, I lift my, my hand up first. <clears throat> we're all guilty of this. Uh, did you hear about the meeting that the procrastinators uh, held, uh, uh, scheduled? It was postponed till further notice. That's, that's us. Are those sins of omission? Yes, the sins of omission. Uh, James talks about if you know something that you're supposed to do and you don't do it, yes. that is a sin. And that's a good point because it's sins of omission are not preached today that often. Right? They're not preached. Uh, they're just as bad as sins of commission. We focus so much on the sins of commission that we forget about the sins of omission. That's a really good point. There was another proverb similar to this one. And it was, and it likewise was along the same lines. The Jews were saying, "The vision that seeth, that he seeth, is for many days to come, and he prophesieth of the times that are far off." The prophets are come going around and telling us that this is going to happen. It's not going to happen in my days. It's like our government. What do they do? They kick the can down the road. Eventually, the next generation is going to worry about the deficit, or the next generation is going to worry about uh, environmental pollution. Or the next generation is going to worry about our, our taxes or, or this or Social Security. They just keep kicking the can down the road. No, no one's going to do anything. That's right. <laughs> so they feel, I think they appease their own conscience by saying, we'll deal with it that later. Yeah. You had a question? Did you have a question? Okay, I thought a hand, I saw a hand over there. Spurgeon equated this to Christians who are delaying in surrendering to God. Uh, I, I prepared this note way before, this, me this lesson way before I had a conversation with the, this individual this, uh, this morning, uh, who wanted, he, he, he was convicted that he was not surrendering to God. And the Holy Spirit's con convicting him, saying, you need to surrender to God. One day I'll serve God. One day I'll go to church. One day I'll start giving. One day I'll get right. But you know what the problem with that is? That day never comes. <laughs> right? That day never comes. Because if you wait for tomorrow, tomorrow becomes today, and tomorrow never comes. Furthermore, Spurgeon said, God knows the frivolity of your plea for delay. Guilty? He knows that you yourself are doubtful about it, and dare not stand to it so as to give it anything like a solemn consideration. Very hard do you try to deceive yourself into an essay, an easy state of conscience concerning it. But in your most, but in your innermost soul, you are ashamed of your own falsehoods. One of the things that I, I, I've, I've taught on this before, and I've learned that when Net needs help, I drop what I'm doing and I help her. I said, if you need help, you ask me. I'm not going to volunteer. That was a deal. That, that was the deal we had early in our marriage. I'm not going to get out of my way to help you. I'm not going to volunteer to help you. But I give you this promise: if you need help and you ask me for help, I'll try to drop what I'm doing and I will help you. And there's peace that way. Because then she can never say, well, you don't do anything, or you don't help me, or you don't... Did you ask for help? Did I not promise that if you ask for help, I'll drop what I'm doing and help you? 
I know you say, okay, you're just putting it off on her. Hey, there's peace. That's our agreement. You may not like it. And that's why couples have uh, their own rules, right? So God through Ezekiel promised that his words will no longer be postponed. Now, we, we know that God's long-suffering. But there's one thing about the long-suffering of God. Who knows what it is? It comes to an end. There's a limit to the long-suffering of God. God has a timer. And until the timer's running, he's long-suffering. When the timer's done, God says, okay, time's up. And he doesn't give you... It's like uh, there was a certain... I heard someone talk about a politician. He goes, well, we're going to draw a line in the sand. And if they pass that line, we're going to do something about it. And he just kept pushing the line further down, further down, further down. The thing was done. That's what politicians do. <laughs> Until the line disappeared. <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> he did do something. Stop. Stop. Okay. I don't want my kids to say anything that may get me into trouble, so I have to stop them. Oh. But God, through Ezekiel, said that uh, what he promised through the prophets would soon come to pass. And Christian, if you do not wake out of your spiritual sleep, there's going to come a day of reckoning between you and God. There is going to come a day of reckoning. But if that day comes, it may be too late for you. It may be too late. So quit putting off what you ought to do for God today. Quit putting it off. And to some extent, we're all guilty of that. Yes. And, I, and, I, and that's why I believe church is so important. Because there's going to come a time where you're going to be down, and the way you're going to be encouraged by seeing your brother and sister in Christ with having joy or being excited about God. And you know what that is? What, you know what the thing, about, the, the thing about excitement is? It is what? Contagious. Contagious, that's right. It's contagious. That's why we need to gather together. That's why we need to assemble ourselves together. Because let's face it, we're all human beings. We're all subject to... The Bible says, to like passions, like Elijah. There's going to come times where I'm going to be discouraged. There's going to come times when you're going to be discouraged. But the beauty of gathering together is the odds of us all being discouraged at the same time are slim to none. You see, that's how it works. Now, if that's the case, we're all in deep trouble. But that's not usually the case. Chapter 13. Now we get into chapter 13. And now God turns the tables to these false prophets and God tells Ezekiel prophesy against the prophets and the word of the Lord came unto me saying son of man prophesy against the prophets of Israel that prophesy and say unto them that prophesy out of their own hearts hear ye the word of the Lord thus saith the Lord God woe unto the foolish prophets that follow their own spirit and have seen nothing O Israel thy prophets are like the foxes in the deserts Ye have not gone up into the gaps, neither made up the hedge for the house of Israel to stand in the battle in the day of the Lord. They have seen vanity and lying divination, saying, The Lord saith, and the Lord hath not sent them. And they have made others to hope that they would confirm the word. Have ye not seen a vain vision, and have ye not spoken a lying divination? Whereas ye say, The Lord saith it, albeit I have not spoken. So now God is upset at these false prophets and he's going to turn on them and he pronounces some serious judgments against them which we're going to see a little bit later if, if time permits <coughs> it would be the same thing today as god saying preach against the preachers now we have to be careful when we say that because many people i don't know if you've heard it they they equate preach a preacher as a prop modern day prophet how many of you have heard that that is a dangerous doctrinal path to follow and i'll explain to you why a preacher today is not a prophet. A prophet is someone who got direct revelation from God. Direct revelation from God. Today, I, when I preach, I preach the Word of God. I don't get direct revelation from God because I have all the revelation that I need right here in this book. I don't get the, another word from the Lord. I've got it all here. Now what I do is I study the book and I pray and I bring you a message out of this book. See the difference between preaching and prophesying? Yes. What I preach is, okay, this is what God tells us in here that you have access to. I'm just basically wording it in a different way so you can get, so you can get encouraged. Because in the New Testament, women were, were allowed to be prophets. Did you know that? 
God allowed the women to be prophets. And who allowed that? That's right. Say louder. God did. Yes. There were female prophets in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. Both Testaments, there were female prophets. Do you call them prophets or prophetess? Uh, a prophet. A pro if I call, if okay, I better be careful how I say this. She is a prophet. He is a prophet. Do you see that? A prophet is the noun. Okay. That's the, the prophet is the noun. Mm -hmm. And that's where a lot of people get confused in the Greek because Greek language is similar to that. For example, uh, she is a servant. Phoebe is an example of that. And the, and the servant Phoebe and the, Phoebe the servant. In Greek it's masculine, a masculine noun. Diakonos, masculine noun. But the modern Bible translations, they took this servant, this word servant, because the Greek word, when, it, when it's translated into deacon, has a different structure. The noun has a different structure. It's the office of a deacon, that Greek word structure. But the word deacon, diakonos, which can be translated, transliterated as deacon in the Greek, also means servant. So context will tell you how to translate the word. Just like in Sunday we said the Greek word gamos could mean wedding or the wedding feast, the marriage feast or the marriage ceremony. So context will tell you how to translate it. So what these modern versions have done is they've taken a masculine Greek noun and translated it into an English female noun as deaconess. Look at the modern versions. Why do they do that? They open the door. Oh, if a woman can be a deacon, then she can be a pastor. See how that works? Yes, sir. But doesn't the scripture say the deacon must be the husband of one wife? Hey, today I don't think it matters. <laughs> Sorry. I, I didn't mean to be funny. Uh, Robert said, doesn't the Bible say that the deacon should be the husband of one wife? And I said, today it doesn't really matter. No, you're absolutely right. I, I, I have... Sometimes I can't help myself. <laughs> when I'm funny, it's not. It's by accident. It's by accident. But that's what the Bible says: the husband of one wife. These are the qualifications. Yes. Oh, and then I have. I heard people actually dance around that. No. Uh, let me ask you this: How many of the apostles were female? None. None. How many of the priests were female? None. 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 How many of God's leaders were female in the Old Testament? None. None. Deborah was not a leader. She was a what? A prophet. Mm -hmm. And she literally had to grab uh, Barak yes. by the scruff of his neck and say, Hey, you're the guy that God chose. Come over here. Yep. That's what she did. Read the text. Because many times, Deborah is used an example of a, of a female leader. That's right. But God used her because Barak wouldn't get off his duff. And God used a woman to rebuke him and say, Hey, you come over here. You have to lead God's army. You see? It's all, the scripture is very clear. Very black and white. So there is no female preachers. Now, we all preach the gospel. Right? But preaching the gospel doesn't make you a preacher as in the sense of a pastor or, or a bishop. The office of a bishop is only open to men and only men who meet certain qualifications. The Bible is very clear. You have to be the husband of one wife. It doesn't mean only one and only wife. And it also doesn't mean you can have more than one wife. One wife at a time. Now the Bible allows... Uh, for, for divorce under certain circumstances. It's very clear in the scriptures. And the Bible allows a person to get remarried after the spouse dies. So there's a legal... Uh, in the New Testament, there are three legal reasons for getting remarried. It's not wrong to get remarried. If God allows it, then God allows it. But we're not going to get into that this evening. <clears throat> so among the Jewish people of Ezekiel and Jeremiah's day, there were many false prophets who were contradicting the word of God. And instead, we're preaching a positive message. A positive message. Be careful of those preachers who preach positive messages. Now, 
Not, that is not to say that a preacher has to get there every Sunday and, and beat God's flock. That's not right. Uh, uh, every once in a while, the sheep need to get sheared. That's a fact. But when you shear them every day, you're gonna, you, they're going to start bleeding. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3, the Bible says, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. Oh, who do you think you are telling me that women cannot be pastors? I got called from God. I've heard a woman say, God called me to be a pastor. Sorry, lady. You either had too much pizza the day before, your doctor gave you the wrong prescription, it was not God who called you. Now, the, the power of the devil is that he can mimic the Holy Spirit. That's why you have to be yes. careful with these charismatic yes. movements. Yeah. I'm telling you here, the devil can mimic the Holy Spirit. And that's why when it comes to music, you've got to be careful in what music you choose. Yes, we have liberty in Christ. I, I cede you that point. I'm not going to argue that. But you've got to be careful to, uh, with the music that you listen to because the devil can mimic to some extent the Holy yes, Spirit. Yes, yes. The time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. The time has come today. All people want to hear is a positive message. Make me feel good, Pastor. Tell me that I'm okay. Please do not preach against sin. There was a meme. I call it a meme. I don't know what else to call it. Someone sent me a few days ago, and it went like this. And, and, and It's funny. That's why i got to share it with you. I don't preach about sin. It is not good for your self-esteem. Some of you will get that. It is not good for your self-esteem. You Sorry? I just found that funny. Yeah. We gotta we gotta we gotta compose ourselves. So now you're gonna say to me, and you're right. Why are you making fun of this guy? I'm not. I'm just telling you what somebody said. But I'll tell you this. I'll tell you what I've observed. I've observed the following. I know several people who say, Oh, I get blessed when I listen to this individual. Okay. But you know what I have observed? That those people who tell me these things, that they get blessed, you know what I observe in their lives? Nothing changes. Yes. There is no change in their life. Yes. They are still the same. They still struggle with the same things. Yes. They still can't get their act together. So if the preacher that you're listening to doesn't get you to change, quit listening to him. Oh, I get so blessed. Then why aren't you changing? Why aren't you doing the things that God expects of you? How long have you been listening to this guy? Oh, I get so blessed. Well, I'm glad you get blessed. But are you changing? The preacher needs to preach to your soul, not to your feelings, not to make you feel good. And I'll tell you why, may, and I'll tell you why many Christians struggle. And I'm going to say this as lovingly and as gracious as possible. They cannot bring themselves to do the simple things for God. And the reason why they can't do that is because they don't want to. Okay, so I'm going to, I'm going to give you an illustration, a personal illustration. I'm going to get a little personal here. I enjoy Doritos. I love Doritos. It's not good for me, but I love eating Doritos. So when my when my wife wants to go shopping, sometimes I go with her as an excuse so I can buy put Doritos in the in the shopping cart. And when I eat Doritos, it upsets my stomach. And I have to go to the bathroom. So today my son says, Daddy, Daddy, I said, What is it? I know why you react when you eat Doritos. I said, Why? They have lactose in them. I said, What? And he pulls out the bag, he pulls out the, the thing, and it says lactose. And I'm lactose intolerant, so is he. So I said, I put two and two together. Why didn't I look at the ingredients? Because I liked the chips so much, I didn't want to look at the ingredients. Because I wanted to eat my chips, even though they disagree with me. You see, you understand now what's going on? Well, I don't want to, I like what I'm doing. Don't tell me the, th the things that God wants me to do. I, I like how I, the way I'm living right now. That's the problem with people. They don't want to. The false prophets of the day were telling people, "Don't worry, God's not going to give you. God's not going to give up Jerusalem. God's going to protect you. He's not going to give you over to the hands of the Babylonians. And those who are in exile, guess what? They're coming home soon." But God points out three things about these false prophets. He says, "They prophesy out of their own hearts. They follow their own spirit. And three, they see nothing." 
That is, they're not receiving a vision from me, God. And all because of these things, God calls them fools. He calls them fools. They believed what they had to say was more important than what God had to say. And today, I hate to tell you this, this occurs in many, many charismatic churches. They get excited. They get emotional. They get worked into a frenzy. And they utter things that they attribute, I got received a word from the Lord. You're not going to receive a word from the Lord because the word, the word of the Lord is already given to us. I'm sorry. I'm sorry to tell you. Now, God may speak to your heart. I don't dismiss that. God may say to you something about yourself. But God is not going to tell you something about somebody else. He doesn't do that. God is... God may say something to me about my children. He will do that because they're my children. They belong to me. But God's not going to tell me anything about your children or about your life. You see how that works? I can't say, I received a word from the Lord that you are going to be a great leader. I had too much pizza the night before with too many onions on it. That's the problem. God does not do this. And how do I know this? And that's why it's so important to spend time in the book because that's how you learn. How are you going to discern when someone's preaching and teaching to you that it comes from this book? There's only one way. You too have to become a student of this book. I am one of the most introverted people God has ever created. I'm being honest with you. When I was a young person, all I wanted to do was stay in my bedroom all by myself, read books. That's all I wanted to do. I hated public speaking. I remember one time in French class, we had to get up and speak, and I was in a mess for the whole week. I was in, and my stomach was in knots. I was having panic attacks. I was getting anxiety attacks. I was getting attacks, you name it. All because I was going to go up in the class and speak for three minutes or two minutes. I hate standing in front of a crowd. I cannot wax eloquent. And when I'm funny, it's by accident. And what, when I was younger, I was accused of being too serious. But why am I telling you this? Because regardless of all these shortcomings, my desire was, Lord, what do you want me to do? I'll do it. Lord, you want me to go door knocking? I hate it. I get so scared. Even today when we go door knocking, we haven't done it in a while because we've been in the community twice. We have to start it again. I hate it. But God tells me to do it. Courage is being afraid, but still doing what you have to do anyway. That's what real courage is. We're all good. We're all, we all have fears. We all experience fears. And God describes these false prophets as foxes in the deserts. You know what's particular about foxes who live in the desert? Well, let's just try to set, describe the setting. What is particular about a desert? It's dry. It's hot. There's no water. There's also... Very little plants. So if there's no water, very little plants, what else is there little of? Food. Food. Creatures. So foxes in the desert are particularly hungry and ravenous. And because prey is so scarce, the moment they see prey, what do they do? They pounce on it. They do not miss an opportunity. And that's how these false prophets are. Titus chapter 1 verse 10 and 11 describes them for us. For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not, for filthy lucre's sake. And God says, these prophets have not filled in the gaps, nor stood in the hedges. They lack the courage to stand up and strengthen the people in the time of need. The word hedge in the Bible refers to protection. In Job chapter 1 verse 10, the devil says to God, Hast thou not made an hedge about him, and about his house, and about all that he hath on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands, and his substance is increased in the land. I pray for a hedge of protection. And I pray for a hedge of protection around our people, our home, our church people, my family. And when we pray this, we don't mean for God to erect physical walls around us. But we want God to erect spiritual walls to protect us. And a few chapters later, God laments that he couldn't find a man to stand in the gap. Ezekiel chapter 22 verse 30. And I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land that I should not destroy it, but I found none. Now this is more particular. Yes, we use this as more generally 
that has a more general spiritual application. We're going to get into that momentarily. But specifically, this verse was talking about the leaders of Israel. God said, there's not, one, there's not one leader among my people who's going to pray, just like Moses did, just like Joshua did, just like King Hezekiah prayed, just like King David prayed. God said, there is no leader. And that's the problem with America today. Instead of pleading for God's people, these prophets were in it for their own glory. They were part of the king's inner circle. They enjoyed the limelight. And they told the king the things he wanted to hear. And that's the problem with Russia today. The reason why they're failing, such a powerful country, so great resources. God has blessed that country incredibly. They own 5% of the earth's land. They're number one in oil, gas, trees, water, diamonds, you name it. They're number one. But they tell the leaders what they want to hear. Because they want to be in the inner circle so the whole society is corrupt. And God was looking for these prophets. He's saying... I'm looking at you false prophets, and I don't see one of you who wants to fill in the holes, fill in the breaches, fill in the gaps in the wall. There were holes and breaches around the wall in Jerusalem, and God couldn't get a man to stand there and beat the enemy off as they were trying to get in. The greatest need in America today is for a bunch of men to stand up and say, I will stand in the gap, to make the pledge. I'll pray for our nation's, our nation's sins. I'll pray for our nation's people. I'll pray for my neighbors. I'll pray. I'll pray. In Psalm chapter 12, verse 1, the Bible says, Help, Lord, for the godly man ceaseth, for the faithful fail from among the children of men. In Isaiah chapter 6, verse 8, in Isaiah's days, Isaiah said he heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I, send me. Today, when God says, Who shall I send, everybody scatters. They hide under the, like Saul, he hid among the stuff. That's the Christian today. God says, Who can I use? How many, how many of us would lift up our hands and say, God, here, use me, instead of hiding under the tables behind the couches and, and behind the bushes? And today, we're part of the problem in America. Christians are. I really believe that. So when we see what's going on in society today, who do we blame? We blame the left. We blame this, we blame that. But we don't say, uh, we as Christians have lost our saltiness. We've, our light is, is a shining dim Listen to how Daniel prayed for his people in chapter 9, verse 16. O Lord, according to all thy righteousness, I beseech thee, let thine anger and thy fury be turned away from the city, Jerusalem, thy holy mountain, because for our sins and for the iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem and thy people are become a reproach to all that are about us. Uh, you know what's so special about Daniel? He was one of the most righteous men in the Bible. God picks three men in the Bible. Ezekiel chapter 14. Although Noah, Daniel, and Jacob were in it, as I live, saith the Lord God, they should deliver neither son nor daughter. They shall but deliver their own souls by their righteousness. Job, I said Job, right? I said Jacob, I meant Job. I didn't mean Job. The Bible says Job. This is a great verse to mess up your New Testament theology. Right? by their righteousness. And today we are redeemed by whose righteousness? Christ's righteousness. This verse will mess up your, new, your, your theology. That's okay. God loves to do that. So today we have failed the Lord in being the godly men that we ought to be. No one wants to stand in the gap today. It's, the cost is great. I was talking to someone a while back, not too far back, and we're talking about how, you know, it's the way things are going in America, inflation and the devaluation of the currency and the fact that salaries are not keeping up, that we should have multiple streams of income. And I made the point that most of my life, since a teenager, and I'm not saying this to be braggadocious, but I'm saying this to, to provoke you into, into good works. I said, I spent in the, in the church serving God. Every time the doors were open, I was there. So there was no time for me to have a second income. I did my daily job from 9 to 5. And when I went home, I uh, had some food. And most of the time, we're in church. In fact, when we were in South Carolina, my wife and I, uh, five times a week, we were in church. Five times a week. Think of the extra expense. Gas, tolls, mileage, wear and tear on the car. 
But we didn't care. Why? Because we wanted to serve God. God was first. So you serve God with your time and with your resources and with this flesh that He has given you. That's how you serve God. People are interested in their income. Yes, we got to pay our bills. But you have to want to serve God above that. I, went, I mentioned one time to someone, I said, I was having a conversation, and I said, uh, if someone were to offer you $10,000 not to go to church, would you miss church? How about if they upped the, oh, I wouldn't miss church for $10,000. How about if they upped the ante and the time you get out of your door, someone meets you or Mr. Beast meets you and says, I'm going to give you $100,000 if you don't go to church this morning. And you say, I don't know. How about if he said a million dollars? Would you still go to church? Some of you are not. I'm not going to, I'm going to stop there. <laughs> Caesar knows exactly what I was going to say. <laughs> now, we're, we're close to the end of the lesson. I'm not going to get at the end, but that's okay. We'll continue tomorrow. I want you to turn. Whoops, sorry. Tomorrow. Uh, next week. Next week. Next week. Tomorrow is, is. I was talking about tomorrow never coming. I want you to take your Bibles. <clears throat> And I want you to turn to me to Nehemiah chapter 4. Nehemiah chapter 4. So Nehemiah is about a third from the front of your Bible. Yeah. So Nehemiah chapter 4. And I want us to read this together. So we're talking about God in Ezekiel's day couldn't find a man to stand and make up the gaps. Fill in the breaches on the wall. In Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 11 through 20. And, and our adversaries said, They shall not know, neither see, till we come in the midst among them, and slay them, and cause their work to cease. So the Jews were working in rebuilding their wall, and their adversaries were conspiring to come secretly and kill them. And it came to pass that when the Jews which dwelt by them came, they said unto us ten times, From all places whence ye shall return unto us, they will be upon you. So God was revealing to them what these adversaries were trying to do to them. Therefore said I in the lower places behind the wall, and on the higher places, I even set the people after their families with their swords, their spears, and their bows. After their families. So this was a family affair. And I looked and rose up and said unto the nobles and to the rulers and to the rest of the people, Be not ye afraid of them. Remember the Lord which is great and terrible. And fight. I don't want you to miss this. And fight for your brethren, for your sons, for your daughters, your wives, and your houses. Fight for them. Are we fighting for our brethren, our daughters, our wives, our sons, our neighbors? We're not. That's what God wants us to do. He wants us to fight. He wants us to fight for our sons, for our daughters, for our brethren, for our wives. I keep, I, I keep hearing some of my friends, and I want you to continue for homework, read the rest of this chapter. Read the rest of this chapter. Oh, I want my wife to get saved. What are you doing for your wife to get saved? You want her to get saved, what are you doing? Oh, I want my son to get saved. What are you doing for your son to get saved? Are you just talking about it? Are you serious with the Lord? Do you mean business with God? That's, what, that's the type of men that God is looking for. Men who are willing to fight. Men who are willing to fight. And we don't have these men today. The reason why we don't have these people today is because they are more concerned with the things of this world and the lusts of this world and their careers. Don't get me wrong, we have to pay our bills. I'm not against you having a career. I have one myself. I have a whole laundry list of degrees. I'm not against that. But you've got to make, as you're doing all this, you've got to make God first. Because in the end, what good would it do if you have all these things, but you lose your family. You have all this money in the bank. You have all these letters after your name. You have a 
accomplish great things in the eyes of the world, but you lose your family, what good is that to you? God wants us to fight. And God looked at these false prophets and he couldn't see one that was willing to fight. Mm. Ah, they were saying flattery things. God wants us to fight. So we'll end there. Uh, we'll continue in chapter 13 next week. And uh, I thank God for the book of Ezekiel. It's been, it's been a, a greater blessing than, than I could have imagined. All right, see you guys next week.